Welcome back from the break and I'm going to continue the story <clears throat> of my own personal journey, how I came to be a disciple of Jesus. Let me again share my screen and show you the PowerPoint slide. I said that I'm using the uh, storyboard idea. It's a good way of explaining your faith. And we're in the second slide, which is the Bar Mitzvah. Now, I must tell you that we grew up attending our local synagogue near Rains Park. We celebrated the Jewish festivals, Passover and uh, the Jewish New Year. I always remember visiting synagogue around the time of the Jewish New Year because it was also the time of my birthday. Sometimes even my birthday in October fell on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And I wouldn't be able to get any presents because we didn't eat or drink anything on Yom Kippur. I wasn't really that interested in being Jewish, although I was already um, aware of my family history. And I grew up with nightmares that the Germans were one day going to come and get me. So I was searching not really for God, but for truth and for a reason to live. And I began a process of searching, especially when I went to an English uh, boarding school where we lived away from home. <clears throat> I read so many books. I read lots of atheistic philosophers like Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus. I read about people's spiritual journeys. I read Hermann Hesse's books like Siddhartha. I read the Russian novelist Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, who all explore spiritual searches, trying to make sense of their lives. I tried transcendental meditation, that technique of, of Indian um, meditation. But really, I, I didn't know what I was looking for, but I knew that I hadn't found it. And then I had two friends at school, Simon and Michael. And something very unusual happened in our school. A religious revival broke out. Out of about 500 of us in this school, 50 became Christians almost overnight. And my friends Simon and Michael would have Bible studies in their room and I would go along to argue with them. I was also studying Latin, Greek and ancient history at the time. So I knew quite a lot about the history of ancient Greece, ancient Rome. We even had to read the New Testament in the original Greek as a way of practicing our Greek. So I love to argue, that's one thing you need to know about Jewish people. Where there are two Jews, there are three opinions. And we often have an argument, sometimes we call it arguments for the sake of heaven, which is where you always respect your opponent, you always try and express their view charitably and with respect and you do this to try and understand truth so i would go and argue with my friends simon and michael and i said how could you believe in jesus you know you're such narrow-minded religious fanatics but every time i said these things they either gave me answers that i couldn't refuse or something in their lives showed me there was a difference. They had a joy and a peace that I didn't have. And so I would go to the library and look up objections to their belief that there was no God, that how could there be a God if he allowed suffering, that Jesus wasn't the Messiah, etc. But the more they pushed me, the more I realized I didn't have good arguments. And then I went to hear a Christian evangelist speak at our school and he said a poem which uh, is a nonsense poem it doesn't really make much sense but for me it really had some truth to it it's he said this god is there and he's not there as i was going down the stair i met a man who wasn't there he wasn't there again today I wish that man would go away. And the speaker at this meeting said that God is like that. He's there and not there. We sort of know that he's there, but we don't really want him to be there. 
As I was going down the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. I wish that man would go away. And I realized that for me, God was like that. He was both there and not there. And then when I sat down with my friends, Simon and Michael, and they said to me, what do you think happened when Jesus died on the cross? And why were the disciples so transformed that first Easter weekend? I had an experience which I can now only describe as a vision. They said, what do you think happened when Jesus died on the cross? And I saw an empty tomb. It was in daylight. I wasn't, it wasn't a dream or anything. We were sitting in Simon and Michael's rooms, having a cup of coffee and drink, eating a piece of chocolate cake. But I saw an empty tomb as clear as day. And it was like looking back 2,000 years in history. And I realized that Jesus had risen from the dead. And I was absolutely astounded. So I said to my friends, Simon and Michael, perhaps you're right. Perhaps Jesus did rise from the dead. But I'm Jewish and we're not supposed to believe in Jesus. And by the way, that's the title of my book, which tells my story. But I'm Jewish. A Jew for Jesus tells his story. If you'd like a copy, I can get one to you or you can download a version. I'll give you the link uh, later with the slides. I said to them, but I'm Jewish. We're not supposed to believe in Jesus. And immediately I knew that that put me in conflict with my family, with my parents and my tradition, because Jews don't believe in Jesus and what I had just seen in this vision. And it's sometimes the case for Jewish people that the truth is on one side and tradition is on the other. And we have to be willing to follow the truth and not simply our tradition. The rabbis actually say, the teachers of Judaism say, accept the truth from whatever source it comes. And so here am I, a young man about 17 years old, and I've suddenly realized that Jesus has risen from the dead. But I'm afraid of the consequences of what will happen to me if I become a disciple of Jesus. I heard another talk from the uh, Christian speaker who came to our school. His name was Keith, Keith DeBerry. And he said, if you want a relationship with God, it's very simple. There are just three things that you have to do, all beginning with the letter R. You have to repent of your sin, receive Jesus into your life and rely on him. Repenting of sin means that you are truly sorry for the wrong in your life and you ask God to forgive you. Receiving Jesus means receiving him as the Messiah who died on the cross to save us from our sin and to receive him as Lord who is going to be the Lord of our lives, who has a good plan for our lives. And rely on him means giving your life to Jesus and following him as a disciple. Repent, receive, and rely. I went up to the speaker at the end of his meeting and I said, well, that's very simple, but, and here was my intellectual doubt and my intellectual objections coming. I said, but how can I put my faith in God when I haven't already proved that he exists? Wouldn't I be compromising my intellectual integrity? Which I thought was a very intelligent objection. But the answer that Keith gave to me shot through me like an arrow. It opened me up from inside. He said to me, are you sure that that is not just your pride that is speaking? It cut me through like an arrow because I suddenly realized that the root of my objection to letting God come into my life and accepting Jesus as my Messiah was not my intellectual doubts. It was that I didn't want to let God in control of my life 
and that in God's eyes I was a proud sinful human being who needed to repent and needed forgiveness. So I went away to think about that and that night I got down on my knees and in tears I said the prayer I asked God to forgive me my sin and I asked Jesus to come into my life as the Messiah who died for my sin and I said I would rely on him and I had an amazing experience of feeling at peace of knowing that God was in control that everything was going to be okay it was like letting go of myself and holding on to God and even though I didn't really understand this that was the beginning of my first steps of faith of becoming a disciple and I went to Bible studies at our, our school. We had a Christian forum with lots of new believers in Jesus going along. And I met with our, our pastor who gave me some first steps in how to grow as a disciple, how to read the Bible for yourself, how to pray, how to share your faith, how to be part of a church, how to use your gifts and your talents in God's service. And I said to him at the time, but I'm Jewish. What does that mean? And he wisely said to me, that's a gift that God has given you. And as you grow in your faith, you will discover more and more of what it means to be a disciple. And so I went from my school where I'd asked Jesus into my life back home. And I joined our local Anglican church. And even without fully understanding it, I... I got baptized by sprinkling and I was wet. And yet I had this question, what does it mean to be a believer in Jesus and to be Jewish? Because many of my Jewish friends would say, forget this Jesus business. Come back to the synagogue. Jews don't believe in Jesus. Be a nice Jewish boy. And my Christian friends, I heard them say, now that you've become a Christian, you're no longer a Jew because old things have passed away and the new has come. Perhaps they didn't mean that, but that's what I heard because I encountered Christians who didn't know Jewish people and didn't really like Jewish people and thought that being Jewish was a challenge to being a Christian. Well, I'm fortunate to say that not only I, but other members of my family also became Christians. My brother, my father and my grandfather. In fact, when I told my father I wanted to go to church, Adolf Anthony Hirschland, who became Anthony Harvey, he said to me, oh, I was thinking of going to church also. And even though he and my mother were founding members of our local synagogue near Rains Park, he hadn't found God there. And he was asking questions about life and about the meaning of suffering and about what the spiritual purpose of his life was and he wanted also to come to church and he too as did my brother and my grandfather become believers in Jesus. Now I grew in my faith and after I was baptized by sprinkling I came to believe that the Jewish way of baptism is by complete immersion so I practiced that I won't get into a discussion here about which method, as long as you are a disciple of Jesus and you show obedience and witness to him, there are many different ways. Uh, but then I began to serve in Christian ministry and I became a member of a Jewish mission agency, the Anglican Church, Christian ministry amongst the, Jew the church's ministry amongst the Jewish people. And I also joined the Messianic synagogue that I helped to found in uh, London. So I was involved as an evangelist with Jews for Jesus. I still am. I'm a senior researcher with them. And I was a founding member of the first Messianic Jewish congregation in London in modern times. So I began working and serving as an evangelist and as a church planter and as a messianic jew i will come back to what it means to be a messianic jew later but let me continue with my story uh, i wanted to marry a jewish believer in jesus like myself so that our children would be 
fully Jewish and so that I would be able to share my faith with conviction to my own family. And of course, God doesn't always answer our prayers, but eventually he brought a wonderful lady into my life, Monica. Her story is also told in, in my book here, But I'm Jewish. And uh, we stood under the chuppah, the Jewish wedding canopy, and uh, I broke a glass under my foot, which is the traditional Jewish symbol of a wedding. You, the husband, the bridegroom breaks a glass under his foot. Traditionally, this is a sign of mourning, of sadness at the destruction of the temple, because in Jewish tradition, even in the most joyful of occasions, a Jewish wedding, there is always a sign of mourning for the loss of the temple and the hope of the Messiah coming to rebuild the temple. Of course, also in a Jewish wedding, when you break the glass under your foot, everyone says, Mazel Tov, congratulations. And some people say this is the last time that the man gets to put his foot down. I'll leave you to work that one out. So my marriage to Monica, we had a Messianic Jewish wedding service. A rabbi who had become a believer in Jesus took the service for us. And then uh, I've had two children, my daughter, Rebecca Karis, and my son, Joshua Samuel. And uh, then I went back to the Bible college where I'd studied. I'd previously studied theology as my first degree at university. And then my Bible college training at All Nations Christian College, which prepares people for cross-cultural ministry in every nation, culture, tribe and tongue. And I began teaching at Bible College, teaching the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and teaching Jewish studies and teaching biblical Hebrew. You don't know how much you don't know until you have to teach other people. So for me, teaching students who were preparing to be missionaries was a great way of deepening my faith because their questions forced me to study and to think and also to write. And that's where I wrote uh, my PhD, which again, I would recommend if you're interested in the Messianic movement, it's called Mapping Messianic Jewish Theology. I can give you details, you can order it online from my website or from amazon.com. Uh, and I went to uh, really try and understand how Jewish disciples of Jesus like me express their faith both to Jews and to Christians. What does it mean to be 100% Jewish and 100% a disciple of Jesus? I will go into that in other sessions, but as I just unpacked the rest of my testimony, I began to write and publish on Messianic Judaism and its theology. Uh, I went backwards and forwards to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv in Israel. We were hoping to uh, move to Israel. I'm still hoping to move there, but then grandchildren came along as well. But I began to be involved in reconciliation between Israeli Messianic Jews and Palestinian Arab Christians in Israel, Palestine. I also was involved in dialogue with other Christian groups such as Roman Catholics and other Protestants. And so I've been writing and teaching and researching on Messianic Judaism really for the benefit of Christians and Jews grandchildren came along in England and so my wife wasn't so keen on going to Israel and I'm it seems I'm still here in England at the moment uh, Noah and Eliana and now a third grandchild uh, Imogen but my story doesn't end there and like everybody's story we have a future hope of the return of Jesus the setting up of his kingdom the restoration of Israel and the fullness of the nations. So I'm now just giving you an update on how I came to believe in Jesus. But really, I'm looking forward to the future as well. So my story can be summed up in these 12 slides, these 12 scenes from a storyboard that I'm born Jewish, brought up Jewish, started to find or search for the truth, my own path, 
I met Christians who loved me and shared the Bible with me, and I had an experience of Jesus risen from the dead, an empty tomb. I knew he'd risen from the dead. I was then became a disciple, baptized, and studied for ministry and worked as an evangelist and as a church planter. Marriage and children came along. I've been teaching in the Bible college and writing and teaching about all the issues that affect Jews and Christians. Now, when you're Jewish and you believe in Jesus, you get the best of both worlds. You get Saturdays off for the Sabbath and Sundays, day of rest. By the way, this is my Jewish humour. You have to hear my humour with a pinch of salt because when Jewish people use humour, we're often serious and funny at the same time. Sometimes you laugh and you cry at the same moment. So I would say that when you're Jewish and you believe in Jesus, you get the best of both worlds and double the headaches, double the problems. You get Saturdays off and Sundays. You get Christmas presents on Christmas Day, and you get eight days of Hanukkah presents at the Festival of Hanukkah, which occurs at the same time as Christmas, more or less. You get the best of both worlds. You get double the amount of festivals, double the amount of food and family and happy occasions, but you also get problems. And for me, I did not realize this, but being Jewish and believing in Jesus puts you in both groups at the same time. And these two groups, Jews and Christians, do not really know each other and often do not like each other. They've had 2,000 years of disagreeing over whether Jesus is the Messiah. And sadly, Christians have often persecuted the Jewish people and made them suffer in the name of Jesus. For Jewish people, when we think of Christianity, we often think of the bad things, the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, the Nazi Holocaust, all done by people who called themselves Christians. Most Jewish people have never met a real Christian who's shown them the love of Jesus. And most Christians do not have any Jewish friends. After all, there's only 16 million Jewish people in the world, but there's something like 2.6 billion people who call themselves Christians. I often ask my Christian friends, I'm asking you now, do you have any Jewish friends? And if you don't think you do, actually, your best friend is Jewish. His name is Jesus. And if Jesus is your best friend, then you want to introduce your best friend to other Jewish people so that he can be their best friend also. So my story, my testimony is about a nice Jewish boy who grew up in synagogue, who comes from a Jewish family all back the way back to Abraham who's become a disciple of the greatest Jew who ever lives, because Jesus is my rabbi, my Messiah, and my Saviour and Lord. And yet I'm in the middle of two groups <coughs> who are suspicious of each other. Now, you may have heard the term intersectional or intersectionality. It's a term that anthropologists use to describe people who are members of two minority groups. It's, for example, like black women in the USA. At the moment, we are very strong on, on Black Lives Matter, and we're also very strong on, on women having equal rights in the workplace. But when you put these two groups together, black women, they are often ignored or misunderstood because they belong to both groups, but they make up another group in themselves. It seems to me that Jewish disciples of Jesus, Messianic Jews, we also call ourselves Jewish Christians, Hebrew Christians, are members of an intersectional group who are both Jewish and Christian. But because we're both, we are seen, we are viewed suspiciously by both Jews and often by Christians, 
and we are not understood by many others. But think about it for a moment. All the first disciples, the first followers of Jesus were Jewish. Matthew, Mark, Luke, probably, John, Paul, the early disciples in the book of Acts, all the first few generations of followers of Jesus were Jewish. And God has not forgotten his people. And God made promises to Israel which have yet to be fulfilled because Israel is called into a covenant relationship. And if you think about Jesus himself, Jesus was born a Jew. He lived a Jewish life. He kept the Torah. He died on the cross and rose again from the dead as a resurrected Jewish Messiah. Now, I know that Jesus is also fully, fully divine. He is both fully human and fully God. But we must not allow these two aspects of Jesus's human and divine nature to contradict each other. He is fully God in human form. He is also fully Jewish. And unless we understand him as the Jewish Messiah, we cannot fully understand him as the risen son of God or as the savior of the nations. Now, you do not need to become Jewish to believe in Jesus. Jesus is for everyone. And we are told to make disciples of all nations. But it seems to me very helpful and important to continue to see that Jesus is in relationship and in continuity with his people. And that's why at the very beginning of my session, I showed you the picture of the white crucifixion, which is where Jesus is on the cross, surrounded by Jewish people. This was Mark Chagall, the Russian Jewish Impressionist, painting, imagining Jesus fully Jewish. He's on the cross, wrapped in a Jewish prayer shawl to conceal his nakedness. He's got written on top of over his head, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. In Hebrew, Yeshua Hanotsri, the Melech Yehudim, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. To the side of the cross, there is a ladder, which Chagall uses to speak about Jacob's ladder, where Jacob had the vision of seeing the angels ascending and descending to God from the earth. And Chagall is saying here that Jesus is the way to go to God. And the ladder next to Jesus shows that Jesus is with his father in heaven and also with us on earth. And then around the sides of the cross, you can see on the right hand side a fire which is a synagogue being burnt by those who are persecuting the Jewish people, probably in Russia. And on the bottom right, there is a man with a bag on his back, carrying holy items and his possessions. There's a lampstand, the lampstand of the temple candelabra underneath the cross. And on the left, there is a man carrying the scrolls of the Torah as he escapes persecution. In the middle on the left hand side, there is the boat carrying refugees, maybe to Palestine, to escape from their burning villages, which you see in the uh, centre on the left. The burning villages with a group of Cossacks or soldiers coming in with swords and guns. And above Jesus on the cross, there are the ancestors of Israel, Abraham and Moses, Sarah, Rebecca, praying and wailing at the suffering of their people. So for me as a Messianic Jew, and I've told you my story, and in the next sessions, we will go into what Messianic Jews believe and what their history is. I want to say thank you to God for showing me that not only have I been called to be part of a special people, but I've been given a special commission to be a disciple of Jesus and to make disciples. If you'd like some homework, I suggest that you learn to tell your story 
using this storyboard approach. You need to work out the key scenes in your story and create a narrative timeline. How does your story fit together historically? Decide about the level of detail and write a description for each slide or each picture in your story. Use paper, use a graphic design program. Uh, maybe they will make a Hollywood movie of your story. Thank you for listening. And this is the end of the second section of this first lecture.